Hello everyone, welcome to This Week in Stupid for the 30th of September 2018. Because I will no longer be producing This Week in Stupid, Dev from Short Fat will be uploading content to my main channel. I'm tired though, you know? I'm, I'm tired. Thank you very much, Sargon. Rest assured that while you're sleeping off your low dopamine levels, This Week in Stupid is in good hands. And just so I don't break tradition, uh, today I have vanilla hazelnut coffee. And man, is it tasty. Mmm. And the subject of this week's episode is university stupidity. Let's jump right into it. A mathematician says activists made his paper disappear because its findings offended them. At behest of a feminist professor, an academic journal's board reportedly threatened to harass the journal until it died. Theodore Hill, a retired professor of mathematics at Georgia Tech, claims that activists successfully pressured the New York Journal of Mathematics to delete an article he had written for the academic journal because it considered a politically incorrect subject, the achievement gap between men and women at very high levels of human intelligence. See, it doesn't even say what, what stance this, uh, this professor took on this subject, just that he was considering it. If you consider it now, you have to be banned. You have to be censored. You have to be thrown out. Your journal has to be harassed until it dies. The greater male variability hypothesis, first proposed by Charles Darwin, suggests that there are more men than women at both the bottom and the very top of the distribution for intelligence scores. More men than women are Nobel Prize winners and chess grand champions, and more men than women are homeless, unemployed, and in prison. Men as a group express greater variability in aptitude and ability. This difference, of course, need not be innate. It could be the case that social custom and pressure... Hold on a second, guys. It's, it's my girlfriend. Hey! Hi. What do you want? Well, if you let me finish my sentence, I'd tell you. Uh, I'm currently live, and the phone's right up against the mic. Say hello. Hi, guys. I didn't know you were live. Okay, what, what do you, what's, what's going on? <laughs> but you're worse than V. I'm going to get in shit for that later. So the whole point of the greater ma male variability hypothesis is basically that because men are more biologically disposable than women are, nature kind of has more free reign to, uh, to tinker with them and to see what works and what doesn't in terms of random mutations. Um, and this is obvious because... You know, in order to, to secure reproduction, men have to have sex for, like, at the, at the very least, the absolute minimum, a couple of minutes. Meanwhile, women have to carry the child for nine months. So, biologically speaking, men are just not as valuable. I mean, socially speaking, of course, we can have a completely different conversation there, but biologically speaking, that is just the way it is. So... If, there, if, if random mutations have to happen, it's better overall for them to happen in the males of a species than in the females. Which, which I think makes sense. Because, you know, one woman who gets knocked out of the game, that's, that, that's a far bigger hit to a population biologically than one man that gets knocked out of the game. So, nature will, will tinker around with random mutations in men. Sometimes they're bad and they, be, and they become fucking losers. Sometimes they're good and they become, you know, gifted geniuses or something. Hill says that he and a co-author came up with a theoretical model that would help explain the gap, then attempted to publish a paper about their work in, the, in Mathematical Intelligencer. The paper was accepted, though the topic is controversial. Larry Summers resigned as president of Harvard University in part due to criticism he received for broaching the subject of variability at an academic conference. This subject of variability is, one, <laughs> the truth. And two, it's a political minefield right now because people just don't want to hear that maybe there's a biological component to some things. That you know, you're, now you're being a biological essentialist or some, something ridiculous like that. As might have been anticipated, the paper was poorly received by feminist scholars. Hill's co-author, uh, Sergei Tabachitkinov, I, I don't know Russian names, faced strident opposition at Penn State where he is employed as a professor of mathematics. According to Hill, at a faculty meeting the week before, the department head had explained that sometimes values such as academic freedom and free speech come into conflict with other values to which Penn State was committed. Well, guess what? When that conflict happens, 
academic freedom and free speech should win. A female colleague had then instructed Sergei that he needed to admit and fight bias, adding that the belief that women have a lesser chance to succeed in mathematics at the very top end is bias. Sergei had said that he had spent endless hours talking to people who explained that the paper was bad and harmful and tried to convince him to withdraw my name to restore peace at the department and to avoid losing whatever political capital I may still have. This is just basically the, the SJWs, the feminists, the, the postmodernists trying to bully him into capitulation, saying, no, it doesn't matter what your research says, this is a political decision and you, you have to abide by it. The National Science Foundation eventually wrote to him, asking that he remove from the paper any acknowledgement that the NSF had helped to fund the research. This was done, according to Hill, after two Penn State academics, the chair of the Climate and Diversity Committee and, and the associate head for diversity and equity, had warned the NSF that the paper promotes ideas detrimental to the advancement of women in science and at odds with the values of the NSF. And also the truth. I mean, this is this is where it gets particularly ridiculous. Like you see, you see SJWs in in video games, like with Gamergate, or you see Comicsgate, or something like that. And those things are are obviously bad, but it's like I mean I I hate to, to really bring this up, but it really is just just entertainment, right? Like it, obviously I don't want these like this to, to happen here, but it's not it's not super super important. But when it happens to suppress legitimate studies, studies with with a factual backing, studies with you know some real meat and potatoes behind them, uh, this is extremely dangerous because now they're saying that their ideology has to take precedent over reality itself. Mathematical Intelligencer rescinded its, its acceptance of the paper. According to its editor-in-chief, publishing Hill and Russian's work would create a very real possibility that the right-wing media may pick this up and hype it internationally. Well, guess what? The Streisand effect kicked in, and now people know about this, you idiots. Moreover, it's not saying that women can't compete at a high level. It's saying that they're less likely to be able to do so due to, due to all of these factors. There, ex there are still exceptional women. Oh, fuck's sake. Okay. In this Colette piece, Hill claims that a University of Chicago mathematics professor, Amy Wilkinson, lobbied the journal to abandon its plans to publish the piece. Sometime later, an editor at another publication, the New York Journal of Mathematics, wrote to Hill and offered to publish the paper. Hill accepted, and the article was published. But then, three days later, the paper had vanished. And a few days after that, a completely different paper by different authors appeared at exactly the same page of the same volume, volume 23, page 1641, where mine had once been. As it turns out, Amy Wilkinson is married to Benson Farb, a member of the NYJM editorial board. Upon discovering that the journal had published my paper, Professor Barb had written a furious email to the NYJM editor-in-chief Mark Steinenberger demanding that it be deleted at once. Unaware of any of this, I wrote to Steinberger on November 14th to find out what had happened. I pointed out that if the deletion were permanent, it would leave me in an impossible position. I would not be able to republish anywhere else, because I would be unable to sign a copyright form declaring that it had not been already published elsewhere. Steinberger replied later that day. Half his board, he explained unhappily, had told him that unless he pulled the article, they would all resign and harass the journal he had founded 25 years earlier until it died. Faced with the loss of his own scientific legacy, he had capitulated. A publication in a dead journal, he offered, wouldn't help you. This is how far these people are willing to go. They will worm their way into any institution. They will put themselves on any board. As soon as they have a foot in the door, they will start bringing in other people who will push their own ideology. And then as soon as they hit critical mass, as soon as the, the, the scale tips, they start censoring everything they don't like. And the media is complicit in this too, because as we all know, math is racist. How data is driving inequality on CNN tech of all places. It's no surprise that inequality in the U.S. is on the rise. But what you might not know is that math is partly to blame. In a new book, Weapons of Math Destruction, Kathy O'Neill details all the ways that math is essentially being used for evil. My word, not hers. Well, at least we know who the idiot is then. From targeted advertising and insurance to education and policing, 
O'Neill looks at how algorithms and big data are targeting the poor, reinforcing racism, and amplifying inequality. These WMDs, as she calls them, have three key features. They are opaque, scalable, and unfair. Denied a job because of a personality test? Too bad. The algorithm said you wouldn't be a good fit. Charged a higher rate for a loan? Well, people in your zip code tend to be riskier borrowers. Received a harsher prison sentence? Here's the thing. Your friends and family have criminal records too, so you're likely to be a repeat offender. Spoiler alert, the people on the receiving end of these messages don't actually get the explanation. Here's the interesting thing. One, all this data collection, uh, it's, it's happening by Facebook and by Google and by Twitter and by all of these, these big tech companies that also likes to suppress conservatives and is run entirely by leftist people. Two, all of these situations that you're talking about, um, the personality tests, it's grouping you in as an individual into, the, into a group of people with, with a similar personality. The zip code example, you're being grouped into people that, that you live near. The prison sentence example, you're being grouped in with your friends and family. These are all collectivist judgments, not individualist judgments. And that's kind of the problem. That's why whenever an SJW talks about collectivism, because they're racial activists or they're gender activists or something, this is the kind of stuff they're ushering in. They're saying it's okay to judge people based on group characteristics rather than assuming the inherent supremacy of the individual. So now we can do shit like this. Okay, okay, okay. If we're going to say that you are a, uh, a white male or you are a black female, then how come we can't say that, oh, you're part of this neighborhood? Oh, you're part of this family? Oh, you're, you're part of this socioeconomic group and just judge you like that? That is what SJWs have brought back from the fucking dark ages of the pre-1960s. Of course, when data is used by the left, everything's fine. But when it's used by other people, it's suddenly white privilege because the Democratic rep said, citing uncomfortable data is white privilege. Republican Iowa rep representative Steve King found himself accused of using his white privilege last week after he offered statistics that Democratic Louisiana rep Cedric Richmond didn't like. It all started at a House Judiciary Committee hearing where King brought up the high crime rates of Central American nations that many immigrants hail from. King called the violence of countries like El Salvador shocking, but then pointed out that some cities in the U.S. have comparable murder rates. And that talk infuriated Representative Richmond, who represents parts of New Orleans, one of the cities that he, he, he mentioned. We just had a conversation about this. We're going to lose all civility in this community if he thinks it's appropriate to compare New Orleans to Guatemala. Richmond fumed while incorrectly identifying the nation King was speaking of. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> the committee chairman, Republican Virginia Representative Bob Goodlatte, tried to calm down the situation by pointing out the obvious. The gentleman from Iowa has the right to make a statistical comparison between two locations. But that only made the Congressional Black Caucus member get even angrier and bring up the inevitable KKK comparison. You are comparing the people in the location. That would be like me comparing him to somebody in the clan. I don't have the basis to do that. Richmond retorted to Goodlatte before humble bragging about how civil and bipartisan he is. Okay, I have a feeling that this article might not be completely uh, unbiased. <laughs> but he said it's not appropriate, it's insensitive, and it's nothing more than a traditional white privilege of let me criticize a minority city. Now take it how you want, I'm telling you how I feel. That's kind of the problem of putting all your chips on collectivism, isn't it? If you identify as some stripe of, of racial collectivist, whether it be like a white supremacist or a Black Lives Matter person or, or whatever, then other people can just simply judge you based on the statistical truths of your group. I mean, if you don't want to be judged as individual Cedric Richmond, but rather as a part of a black community... Well, then we can judge you by the actions of that black community. And I don't think you want that, do you? I don't think you want to have all the crimes of the black community pinned on your shoulders, do you? And this is the ultimate problem with collectivism, because it makes all of that data from, from the previous article uh, relevant, frankly. And this applies to both collectivism on the left and collectivism on the right. Um, it really seems to be right now the centrists... That, that are the only group that promotes actual individualism that says, no, you can't judge people because of their race or their sex or their economic status 
or where they live or any of that nonsense. You just judge them as individuals and, and make individual judgments as you meet them. Um, that seems to be the only way forward because things aren't getting better. They're getting worse. And right now, SJWs are to blame. They're not the only collectivists that exist in the world, but they're certainly the, the ones with the most power right now. And finally, we get to peak university stupidity with student editor who retweeted article pointing out that women don't have penises is fired from university journal. Okay. <laughs> a student editor at a top university has been fired in a transphobia row after he tweeted that women don't have penises. Remember when I said that... Uh, Ideology has to um, has to take precedence over reality. Uh, Angelos Sofekalos, I don't fucking know. Angelos, assistant editor at Durham University's philosophy journal Critique, was sacked from his post after just three days for writing a tweet deemed transphobic by fellow students. He's 24, he's from Cyprus. He faces disciplinary action last month after he retweeted an article by The Spectator on his Twitter titled... Is it a crime to say women don't have penises? With the comment, RT, if women don't have penises. He's technically not even saying here that, that he thinks women don't have penises. He's simply saying that, is it a crime to say so? And asking his followers if they think so or not, you, asking for RTs if they do, retweets. The postgraduate philosophy and psychology student was dismissed from his position at the university after the tweet sparked outrage. He was also fired from his position as editor of Durham University's online magazine The Bubble and forced to resign as president of Free Speech Society Humanist Students. Oh, oh, really? So he, he has to resign from the Free Speech Society over speech. Wait, 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 wait. He didn't even tweet it. So, so he, he did actually take a stand on whether or not women have penises. But he, he didn't even tweet anything. He simply retweeted somebody else's tweet. He was fired for a retweet. The since-deleted tweet has received backlash from former chair of LGBT humanist Christopher Ward, who claimed that the post was factually incorrect and not worthy of debate. <laughs> it's fact so. It's factually incorrect that women, that women don't have penises. Okay, I mean, <laughs> that's one thing, but it's not worthy of debate. <laughs> so you can't debate whether or not women have penises. <laughs> I don't, know, I don't know if there's anything more to say beyond this, guys. He wrote, as a former chair of LGBT Humanist UK, the opposition I experienced from a long, number of long-standing humanist members to trans people and trans issues was a stain on an otherwise great organization. And here's the new president of humanist students RTing horrific transphobic shit. It's, it's, not, it's not even horrific. It's not horrific. <laughs> Maybe, maybe they've watched too much Bible Black or something. I don't fucking know. And of course he's right. He says, he says on Chronicle Live, what I said was a biological fact. We've reached a weird era where we are sacking people for stating facts. Even if this is an opinion, people shouldn't be sacked for having it. We should be having healthy discussions instead of silencing people. It seems like we're taking steps backward. Exactly. That, this, this, this quotation from the guy, this is exactly what basically this entire video has been about. Everything that there's the thesis. All right, I'm just glad I'm uh, I'm not in school anymore. <laughs> um, but I'll be streaming on this channel, on the YouTube channel for once, not the Twitch. I'll be doing the monthly community stream tonight, and we're probably going to be watching um, uh, the third that guy with the glasses movie, Suburban Nights, and taking a big old shit on it. So if you want to uh, want to come by and say hi. Um, drop in. It'll probably be like 7pm or 8pm EST. I'll see you then, guys. I love you.